this is an important topic, and I don't want to rush through it too fast. Depression. Defined as a mood disorder marked especially by sadness, inactivity, difficulty in thinking, and concentration, a significant increase or decrease in appetite, and time spent sleeping. Feelings of dejection and hopelessness and sometimes suicidal tendencies. Depression is a common mental spiritual disorder. More than 300 million people of all ages suffer throughout the world. It's a leading cause of disability worldwide and is a major contributor to the overall global burden of disease. Ladies, more of you are affected by depression than men. And at its worst, depression can lead to suicide. As a matter of fact, over 800,000 people worldwide die due to suicide every year. It's the second leading cause of death in people 15 through 29. And antidepressant medicine is the second most prescribed medicine in the world. Reminded of a man who went to his psychologist and he said, I just got to tell you, I'm dealing with darkness. I'm down. I'm depressed. I, I, I try to put on a happy face every day. I try to be up uh, and uh, it's just not working. Doc, I need your help. The doctor says, I know just the thing. He said, Bozo the Clown's going to be in town tonight. You need to go watch him. That will lift your spirits. He said, but Doc, I am Bozo the Clown. Sometimes that's us trying to put on a happy face, trying to smile and make it look like everything's all right, when deep inside us, it's not. Christians are not immune to this struggle. As Daniel said, this struggle is real. There is a fountain filled with blood is one of my favorite hymns. It's written by William Calpins. He suffered major depression, was in a mental hospital, came to know Jesus Christ and found some healing for his emotional disorders and wrote many songs and poems and literature and his music is full of great depth. It was a fight. He continued to fight the rest of his life, but he continued to look to Jesus Christ. Last week we talked about Martin Luther, this being the 500th anniversary of the Re uh, Reformation. Martin Luther suffered what seems to have been severe psycho-spiritual crisis. He called his problem Anfuktungen. I've been practicing all week trying to pronounce that. I'm sure I got it wrong. This simply means he had trials and tribulations, but this feels too slight of a word to cover the afflictions he describes. Listen to what he went through. Cold sweats, nausea, constipation, crushing headaches, ringing in the ears, Depression, anxiety, and a general feeling that, as he put it, the angel of Satan was beating him with fists. The great, perhaps one of the greatest preachers of all time, Charles Spurgeon, had his first episode with incapacitating depression in 1858. Having been absent from his pulpit for three Sundays, when he returned, he preached on 1 Peter 1.6. Wherein ye greatly rejoice, though now for a season, if need be, you are in heaviness through manifold temptations. In a sermon entitled, The Christian's Heaviness and Rejoicing, Spurgeon said that during his illness, when, quote, my spirits were sunken so low that I could weep by the hour like a child, and yet I knew not what I wept for, a kind friend was telling me of some poor old soul living near who was suffering very great pain, and yet she was full of joy and rejoicing. I was so distressed by the hearing of that story and felt so ashamed of myself, unquote. While he was struggling with the contrast between his depression and the joy evinced by this woman who was afflicted with cancer, quote, he said, this text flashed upon my mind with its real meaning, that sometimes the Christian should not endure his suffering with a gallant and joyous heart, but that sometimes his spirit should sink within him, and that he should become even as a little child smitten beneath the hand of God. In more modern times, one of my favorite preachers that I enjoy listening to and reading is John Piper. He's writing in response to a lady that asked if perhaps she was dealing with depression. And he said, oh, how I feel empathy for this because I've tasted these kinds of seasons many times. I don't want to get out of bed, dread doing the things that we have to do, no motivation for anything. Don't feel like the fighting the fight, the loss of joy in what we thought God had called us to do, oppressed by what feels like demonic darkness. 
many of us here have struggled with that, and your pastor often included. I battle depression, but I don't suffer from it. And here's why. Because I've learned these truths of Scripture that I want to share with you today. There are times as a pastor that I don't pout around about my job. I have the greatest job in the world. But it is a job where you carry around a lot of different things. I wake up sometimes in the middle of the night concerned about somebody who's going through a hard time. Sometimes I'll forget I didn't go visit that person like I should have. I'm always concerned, as most pastors are, that there's lost people who are, who are not coming to faith in Christ. We feel a tremendous amount of pressure if our churches aren't growing. We, we think about all the ministries and all the things that we to, should do or ought to do in order to make sure that everything's going smoothly. We want to be liked. And it's hard when somebody in the church doesn't like you. It, it strikes you at your very core. You feel a tremendous pressure to fulfill your calling and, and to see Christ glorified. And, and nobody has ever done that perfectly well. And so you carry these things around and they wake you up in the middle of the night. And, and sometimes you think, like many pastors, on Monday you're ready to turn in your resignation. But we keep moving forward. Why? Because we all face this at times. For most of us, the struggle with depression is real. But there is a way to overcome this kind of depression. Now, let me just give a disclaimer. Right now, please pay attention to me. There are physical illnesses. There are, there are imbalances in our hormones and chemicals that sometimes cause us real physical issues that bring on depression. Those need to be checked by a doctor. God knows that he's able to heal those. God himself but it's okay to seek treatment just like if you broke your arm or had a kidney stone. It's okay to seek treatment for those types of things. And let me also say there is a depression that's deep-rooted in crisis, in traumatic events in our lives that sometimes needs intense counseling. If you were abused, if you were molested, if you were in battle, there are things in your life that have caused such tremendous problems, such tremendous uh, assault on who you are and what you've been through that you need to seek help. But let me say, most of what we deal with is a spiritual reality. How do I know this? Why? Because our Bible is clear full of people who are battling depression. Think about it. Jeremiah battled depression. Elijah battled depression. We see times with, with, with Paul where he felt like giving up and giving in. And even Jesus is called a man of sorrows acquainted with grief. If you want to know what it's like to be depressed, think about crying so hard that your eyes bleed. That happened to Christ. And somebody for sure that we know was depressed was a king named David. Oh, he was a mighty man of battle. Oh, he had tremendous success. Yes, he was a man after God's own heart. Yes, he's responsible for the great book of Psalms in the middle of our Bible. But in that great book of Psalms, one third of them are laments about going through times of darkness and stress and depression. A full one third of that book of songs are country songs. If David had a pickup truck, he would have lost it. Even his wife laughed at him. I don't blame her. He was dancing around in his underwear in the public square. But nonetheless, he went through difficult times. Think about it. As Ken preached several weeks ago, David had all kinds of enemies, including his very own king, and later on in his life, his very own son, who wanted to be the king. Not only did David have enemies, but David had some serious problems himself. He had sinned by, by having, a, 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 by having a, a census done, and his land sinned against God that caused thousands of his own people to die because of his sin. And not only that, he himself was directly responsible for the death of Uriah as he had sinned with Bathsheba in adultery and arranged for Uriah to be killed in battle. His sin plagued him. His failures plagued him. His enemies plagued him. And it affected him. Affected him deeply. 
earlier this week, this message was coming out of Psalm 42, but as I was doing my own devotions and read Psalm 13, which I shared Wednesday night, this is a much better passage for what we're talking about today. So please open your Bibles to Psalm 13. This is a Psalm of David. How long, Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I wrestle with my thoughts and day after day have sorrow in my heart? How long will my enemy triumph over me? You're going to see here in a moment, this psalm, like all the rest of the psalms of lament, end with praise, but there are some steps to getting there. There are steps to getting from this kind of darkness to the light of the love of the Lord. And here we see David's first step. He identified his issue. That's what you and I need to do. We need to identify our issue. Four times he says, how long, Lord? Here we see in this passage that his enemies are triumphing over him. He has suffered defeat. You and I have all kinds of things that bring us into depression. How many of you have ever had financial depression? Physical depression. I'm telling you what, today if we walked to the doctor's office and he said, listen, I think you have the first stages of Alzheimer. How many of you know that would probably bring some depression? I can testify that when you hear the word you have a coronary artery disease, it brings about some depression. How many of you know that the loss of somebody that you really love can bring about depression? How many of you know that a broken relationship can bring about depression? An unmet expectation can bring about depression. Nothing brings depression in my life any more than conflict. How about failure? Doesn't that sometimes bring depression? I'll tell you what's depressing. Being a Vanderbilt, Kentucky, or Tennessee football fan. Yesterday... Kentucky was supposed to beat Ole Miss. I didn't take the chance. I said, honey, let's go watch Thor movie. I knew that Thor would win. <laughs> the movie was over. I thought it must, it's probably safe. I opened up my phone. There was less than a minute left in the game. I was like, crud. Angie Mills ran off to the restroom because she drank a Coke that big. And I stayed to watch the after credits, and as I was watching them, I kept paying attention to my phone. And then all of a sudden, fumble. Kentucky recovers. Seven seconds left. Hallelujah. Then it disappeared. And the next thing I saw was Ole Miss won by three points. That's depressing. You want to be really depressed? I just heard Butch Jones got a contract extension. <laughs> Many triggers. Here we see that David is feeling like God is distant. Ever feel that way? Psalm 42 says, where have you been? My tears have been my bread day and night while they shot out through me. Where is your God? Boy, I tell you what, sometimes I feel that way, don't you? Here he feels that God is distant. He feels like his enemy is overcoming him. And here we see that oftentimes, in the middle of this, verse 2, that our enemy is our thoughts. How long must I wrestle with my thoughts? How many of you have ever done that? Let's be honest today. I do. Wrestle with my thoughts? I don't know. Last night I was so excited. An extra hour of sleep. Extra hour. I stayed up a little late. I thought I'm going to sleep through the night. I'm going to wake up at 6 o'clock in the morning. And at 5 o'clock in the morning, my dog began to bark. 
5 o'clock. I didn't get that extra hour of sleep. Anybody want a dog? When we wrestle with our thoughts, when these things wake us up at night, when they struggle and they play, play, when they plague us through the day, it can lead to sorrow in our core, to darkness, to heaviness and sadness. It is a weight that we are not designed to carry. And again, Christians are not immune. Women of Faith speaker, former 700 Club host Sheila Walsh, was diagnosed with post-traumatic stress disorder, severe clinical depression. She was admitted to the psych ward for a month. But this experience did not break her. Instead of being broken, she used this as an opportunity to be a whole again as a Christian. Here's what she said. Sometimes God will take you to a prison to set you free. You see, here was the key. The former television host admitted to being scared to admit her flaws, but she found strength in the Holy Spirit when she did. Are you getting what I'm saying here? We need to be able to identify what's going on. When your pastor is fighting off these dark times, here's what I say. All right. I know that the Lord's faithful, and I know he's going to work it all out in the end. And so I'm not going to worry about the church. I'm going to do my job. I'm going to let him take care of it. I cannot be Jesus Christ to people. Jesus has to be Jesus to people. I'll be Brother Tim and do the best that I can. But I'm not going to try to replace the work of the Holy Spirit in people's lives. I talk to myself. I try to do it in private so people don't think I'm crazy. But I do it. Here. We see the psalmist talking to the Lord, talking to himself, identifying his issue, naming his enemy. We can't just ignore the problem. But it's not enough to just talk about it either. We need to take it to a place where it can be handled. Look at verse 3. Look on me and answer, Lord my God. Give light to my eyes or I will sleep in death and my enemy will say I have overcome him and my foes will rejoice when I fall. Here is what we see David doing. He is praying for the problem. When you and I are overwhelmed, as the song says, he will hold me fast. All we need do is ask. Here the psalmist is saying, I need to hear you. Lord, answer me. I need to hear you. Lord, I'm crying out to you. Please speak to me through your scriptures, through your Holy Spirit, through a still small voice, through a wise counsel of a friend. Lord, please speak to me now. Not only does he need to hear the Lord, he needs to see him. Give light to my eyes or I will sleep in death. Here, really, light to my eyes means life. Give me life. And so he's praying for the problem. When the financial burden becomes overwhelming, Lord, I know that you own the cattle and horses on a thousand hills. I know that there's nothing impossible for you. I need your help. Give me guidance. Give me wisdom to spend within my budget. But, Father, I, I know this. I, I, I don't know what's going to happen in the future, but I know that you hold it. I know that you love me, and I can trust you. Whenever your health starts to fail and you start to get older, anybody been noticing that lately? You can go and say, I know that my God will hold me fast. He is the great physician. There is nothing that he can't heal. If he can bring a dead man back to life, then he can take care of my kidney stone. He can take care of my dementia. He can take care of my coronary artery disease. He can take care of my arthritis. There is nothing too difficult for God. And in this I know that once and for all, when I die, he'll give me a new body, and it will never perish again. How cool is that? And so we know as we go to him in prayer, we cast all our cares upon him, knowing that he cares for us, and we simply take the nesty plunge into his loving, caring arms like a child jumping into the water, being caught by his father. Do you pray or do you fret? Lord, I need you. Oh, I need you. Every hour I need you. Bless me now, my Savior, I come to you. And so you may be thinking today, you may be watching this on video, and you may be thinking, what advantage is there then to being a Christian? If you struggle with depression, hey, I'm struggling with depression, why, why should I even care? I'm going to tell you why. 
The struggle that's real makes the victory that we have all the more sweet. I'm going to tell you something. Every one of these psalms, but one, which used to be, which was actually split, it's not supposed to be split, every one of these psalms that has lament, that has this struggle, that comes out of depression, all end with praise. Why? Because I'm going to tell you today that my Christ has overcome, and he is the first fruit of those who will also rise. And I can know that, yea, though they, yea, they who you may slay me, yet shall I live. I know that, 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 that no matter what happens, in the end, I've seen the rest of the book, we win. Why be a Christian? Why go through these times? Why have courage? Why have faith? Listen to verse four, but I, verse five, but I trust in your unfailing love. When Luther was in his deepest, darkest depression, he said the thing that brought me out was I was reading about the love of Christ being poured out for me. And when I realized how much God loved me, it lifted me out of the miry clay and set my feet on the solid rock. I trust in your unfailing love. My heart rejoices in your salvation. Here the psalmist is writing. David is saying, hey, my enemies may look like they're overtaking me. I may have all kinds of problems. I might have this struggle going in on my mind. I might have this darkness in my heart, but I have your salvation. Woohoo! I mean, it could be a bad day, but if you know you're going to Hawaii tomorrow, it's not going to be that bad. My favorite verse, I've told you this before, but when I, when I had kidney stones, it was, this too shall pass. And the Christian knows that because we have salvation, this too shall pass. He goes on, he says, I will sing the Lord's praise. Why? Because he has been good to me. Is there anybody in here today that can testify that God's been good to you? That he's got you this far and he will carry me home. Oh, we respond to depression so many ways that are wrong. We withdraw. We walk away from friends. We turn our back on God. We lash out. We feel sorry for ourselves. We throw a pity party like everybody wants to come to that. We get on Facebook and we start slamming other people. And we, we have bad attitudes. We slink. We slunk. We, we, we go into the dark crevices to try to find safety. But here we see that David focused on the future. Whenever difficult times come, listen to me, friends, we need to focus on the future. I've been paying attention now for 51 years to come tomorrow, and every night of my life has been followed by a dawn. And the psalmist is reminding us that every dark time, every difficult valley is followed by the dawn. And in our lives, it may be dark, it may be rough, but we know, as David says in the 23rd Psalm, I know that I will be in the house of the Lord forever. And so that makes going through the dark valley easier. When we take our focus off where we are and we look at the end of the tunnel and we see the light. Let me just tell you today that we are going to make it. If we are in Christ, the pains and the troubles and the struggles of this world will pass away. Today, I'm finishing in my Sunday school class the last chapter of the last book, and it's really good. And that's the hope that we have. And so when my heart is overwhelmed, he will hold me fast. Spurgeon said, despondency is not a virtue. I believe it is a vice. I am heartily ashamed of myself for falling into it, but I am sure there is no remedy for it like a holy faith in God. Tan Ford gave me a painting for pastor appreciation from one of my favorite scripture passages. Whatever is noble, whatever is pure, whatever is true, whatever is praiseworthy, whatever is virtuous, think on these things, and the God of peace will be with you. And that's true. Let me just finish. Why does God allow us to go through these dark times? I, I don't know for sure. But I can say there are some things in my life that it's helped me with. 
Number one, it makes me a more fitting pastor for an ailing flock. Spurgeon believed that there was a reason why God chose men to be pastors and not angels. Namely, angels cannot feel. Listen to what he says. Men and men subject to human passions, the all-wise God has chosen to be his vessels of grace. Hence these tears, hence these perplexities and casting down. Friends, Christ is the good shepherd and we can, he can empathize with the sufferings of his sheep. So also can a pastor, but so also can God's people understand when they go through dark times what their friends and what the world's going through. Number two, it allows us and me to model faithfulness in the darkness. It's no great feat to praise God when everything's going good. It's hard to praise him whenever it's not. And so for every Sunday that I got up in the pulpit and I didn't feel like it, I believe God is glorified, don't you? And every time that you put a smile on your face and you go back out and you face the world, God is glorified. Number three, it's a great aid to our holiness. Robert Murray McShane quipped, What my people need most from me is my personal holiness. And according to 1 Peter 4.1, one, one of the best places to grow in holiness is in this furnace of affliction. Seasons of suffering and depression have a unique way of causing the world to lose its luster and turning our eyes upon Jesus. Number four, it gives a unique opportunity to display Christ as our all-sufficient treasure. Depression really makes me realize that I cannot do it alone. It causes me to turn to God. And number five reminds us that his grace is sufficient. Paul, the great apostle, says, my grace is sufficient for you. My power is made perfect in weakness. That is the Lord saying it to Paul. When we learn that lesson that he is sufficient in our weakness, we glorify him all the more. Depression, hopefully we keep us from believing that silly gimmicks will lead people to Christ, but great grace will reign. Number six, it keeps us dependent. We cannot stand alone. We cannot walk alone. We were not designed to live outside of the power of the Holy Spirit. If you're going through depression today, maybe it's because you haven't turned to God and say, fill me, use me, speak to me, strengthen me. Help me. Have you cried out to him and said, I can't do this on my own. I need you. I can't handle this anymore. I can't walk under my own power. I need you to carry me finally. Number seven, it causes me, it causes you to be more intimately acquainted with our suffering servant, Jesus Christ. Seems that Paul was praying in Philippians 3, 10, 11, that even if it meant sharing in his sufferings, that he wanted to know Christ. While in prison, Samuel Rutherford wrote of his sufferings, one kiss now is sweeter than ten long since. Sweet, sweet is his cross. Light, light, and easy is, is his yoke. While in the midst of despondency, it's hard to see the man of sorrows, yet he is there. And eventually this trial will lead to a deeper relationship with the suffering servant. Philip Bliss wrote this great hymn. It says, Man of Sorrows, what a name. For the Son of God who came, ruined sinners to reclaim. Hallelujah, what a Savior. Bearing shame and scoffing rude, in my place, condemned he stood, sealed my pardon with his blood. Hallelujah, what a savior. Guilty, helpless, lost were we. Blameless lamb of God was he. Sacrificed to set us free. Hallelujah, what a savior. He was lifted up to die. It is finished was his cry. Now in heaven exalted high. Hallelujah, what a savior. When he comes, our glorious king, all his ransomed home to bring. Then anew the song will sing. Hallelujah, what a savior. I love how that song starts with a man of sorrows and ends as a glorious king. And in Christ, that's what we are. People of sorrows, eventually, to rule and reign with him forever. Amen? So how did David endure those dark times? How did he go through these times of great torment and trial and end? Praise the name of God. He identified the problem. He prayed in faith. And he focused on the future. 